that sort of answer thought. Um, thank you very much. My grateful thanks to the National Museum uh, for the honor that they've done me in asking me to give a talk, um, something I'm greatly looking forward to. Um, let me say at the outset that because we now have museums of their virtually every category of objects. I am restricting my talk. I'm only going to be talking about art historical objects, the kinds of objects that we historians take an interest in and use in the writing of early Indian history. So it is a rather restricted uh, subject that I'm going to be speaking on. People with wealth and leisure and either greed for or sensitivity to art objects have been known to collect them for the past many centuries. However, placing collections in a museum for public display has a more recent ancestry and was initially a European idea. In Europe, it was nurtured as part of a search for a European identity. That surfaced with the Renaissance and later the Enlightenment. Identity was crucial to the Europe of that time, undergoing radical historical change. And every time societies undergo radical historical change, they search for a new identity. The traditional aristocracy in Europe was being edged out by a newly emerging money middle class and colonialism was confronting Europe with cultures very different from its own. People like Hans Sloan and Joseph Banks, both naturalists of the 18th century, with large private collections of a variety of objects, were eager to exhibit them. Others began to collect what we would call objects from the past. Such collections were both a show of wealth and an interest in a sense of heritage. They provided the nucleus for what became major museums in Britain, the British Museum, the Ashmolean, and so on. The money, of course, grew with industrialization and was augmented through colonial ventures. Identity was tied into the definition of culture and class as it generally is. The Renaissance underlined the European inheritance from Greco-Roman culture, even though the latter was unfamiliar to everyone in Europe except the elite. Therefore, when museums emerged, they were also seen as agencies in educating the non-elites of Europe into understanding classical culture. Private collections of art became a symbol of status, as they often do. By the 19th century, they were becoming the nucleus of public museums, some assisted by state funding. This coincided with the European need, need to assert its superiority among world cultures, an assertion legitimizing colonial and imperial power. Bringing the finest objects from other cultures to European museums was also a demonstration of the capturing of other cultures. Used in comparative studies, these objects were said to illustrate the hierarchy of cultures. This may explain why objects from the colonies, described by some as colonial trash, were nevertheless exhibited. This is one of the things that's creating big problems now because some of the best of these colonial trash objects which sit in museums in Europe and America are objects that we would like to have back in our museums and there's a great tussle going on uh, with European and American museum, museums not wanting, wanting to give them up. The function of the museum was to display objects in a classified manner. The earliest museums displayed natural history and cultural artifacts <coughs> in the same space. So, classification began by separating 
natural objects from those that were made by human effort. Geological samples, plant and animal fossils, and natural specimens were included in the first category. These were easier to organize using the classifications of Charles Darwin and Carl Linnaeus. The objects made by humans, ranging from tiny coins to huge obelisks, were more difficult to classify, since the attempt was to place them within a universal history of human evolution. The problem with non-European objects was that not enough was known about them. Stages of evolution were applied to the history of society. Primitive beginnings were followed by a period of growth, culminating in a golden age, subsequent to which there was a gradual decline. And this rise and fall and the cycle of rise and fall came to, apply, to be applied to cultures all over the world. European culture, however, always remained permanently at the apex. What were collected in art historical museums from private collections and some purchase were objects that came to be called antiquities, objects from earlier times. These provided a picture of the past. This activity was expanded after the Enlightenment in two ways. One was that the purpose of the museum was to exhibit objects. The other was that it had to keep up with advances in knowledge. This was specially necessary if the museum was to educate the public. And some museums were actually attached to the university. Turning to India, we have to ask if the same intentions govern the establishing of museums. As an institution, the museum was initially a colonial imposition. It furthered colonial views of knowledge about India with a recognizable ideological purpose of giving an identity to the Indian past. The museum did not grow from the individual collector's activities as in Europe. There were such collections, collections such as those of Sarfoji in Tanjore, of the Mughal princes or the Bhandars of the Jaina monasteries, and occasionally even smaller private ones. These were all known, and old and rare illustrated books in particular were to be found in such collections. But these were initially ignored in colonial times, possibly because access to them was limited. Had the libraries of the Mughal aristocracy been collated, there might not have been a tragic dispersal of their books. However, most museums began as state institutions tied into colonial ideas about the Indian past. The notion of a museum gradually changed. It ceased to be just a collection of objects. It began to be seen as an institution reflecting new knowledge about the biography of the environment and of cultures. Some were isolated cultures, previously unknown. Some, when juxtaposed with others, began to suggest connections that had not been envisaged earlier. The old Wundakama, as it was called, the Chamber of Curiosities, gave way to an institution of learning, and additionally and importantly, to aesthetic enjoyment. In India, the idea of the Ajay Bhutan, the House of Curiosities, still hovers over many museums and detracts from both educational and aesthetic enjoyment. <coughs> What the, <clears throat> what the British collected in India to begin with came largely from their own explorations and excavations and a little bit from donations. The need to house these objects began with placing them in the Asiatic Society premises in Calcutta, conjoining them to ideological studies and to natural history, and to something that the British called the industrial arts which were largely the product of craftsmen. But the objects outgrew the space. It was then thought to house them in the Indian Museum, established in 
1814, exactly 200 years ago. This was about half a century after the British Museum was founded. The museum, as essential to both heritage and history, was an idea familiar to Europe, but was being introduced gradually to India. Museums encouraged the parallel study of such ob objects that were gradually becoming the counterpart to texts. Information from texts is inevitably abstract and intangible. Objects, on the other hand, are tangible and three-dimensional. Often the juxtaposition of objects either creates or erodes connections. The pattern of their proximity is therefore significant. The larger collections fueled the study of historical change through objects that came from the same region over a number of centuries. The change could be of material, from clay to stone to metal, or it could be a form. Such collections also enabled a comparative study of the same object from different regions. One of the most striking examples of this is the portrait of the Mutha. Thus, the head of the Mutha comes from Ganpar in the northwest, from Mathura in the Doha, and from Amravati in South India, representing the same person sculpted in three different regions, not too far apart in time, but physically quite distinct. And central to this difference are history, physiognomy, and the local aesthetic. Acquiring a collection could come from curiosity about the culture. Housing a collection, however, required understanding and classifying it. This was dependent on theories, both of history and aesthetics, which we know changed new knowledge. These drew on the history of the colony as envisaged by colonial scholarship and which had an interface with colonial policy. The question of the broader relationship of European to non-European cultures was obvious. In various parts of the world, colonial interests and intellectual curiosity merged and led to an interest in the ancient histories of other cultures. And therefore you have the deciphering of the hieroglyphs and the cuneiform script which gave access to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. And at the same time approximately, you have James Princep's decipherment of the Brahmi script. This was a new perspective of the beginnings of Indian history because it opened up a body of inscriptions. And inscriptions often challenged the information from Greek and Sanskrit texts. So the complexities of the, of the study of the ancient past began to surface through a variety of sources. Historical classification was either by subject or by chronology. Historical dynastic labels became the chronological norm. In tracing the evolution of a culture and evaluating it, one of the past cultures was treated as the model. If Europe chose Greek art, the choice for India was Gupta art. But the choice was arrived at after much argument. Many preferred the Gandhara art of the Indo-Bactrian Greek period, since it incorporated the more familiar Hellenistic aesthetic whereas others dismissed this and said it was hybrid. Sculpture that came from places more centrally located in British India was described by some as Aryan, adding even more confusion to the use of this label with reference to things Indian. In classifying objects, primacy was given to those representing religion and the life of the elite. This was more so in India, as according to the colonial meaning of the past, religion was seen as the primary factor identifying Indian civilization. And that too, it was the religion of the elite. 
and the elite, of course, were the stuff of history in those days. This unnecessarily narrowed the area of knowledge. For example, some of the most beautifully crafted scientific instruments of early times, aesthetically on par with other objects, such as the superb medieval astrolabes, these were instruments for gauging the position of the stars, were not thought to be that important, however beautiful they were and therefore found no place in the museums of India. Astrolabes are not dynasties, are not deities. They're not gods and goddesses. Um, and although they tell us much more about the universe than do gods and goddesses, such <laughs> objects came low in the hierarchy of museum exhibits. Part of the reason was that Indians of past times were not seen as rational and scientific, despite their impressive contributions to mathematics, medicine, and, and medicine and astronomy. But these were the very subjects that could have been reflected in museums and should be even today. Please note. Uh, they symbolize. It is these beautiful objects that are not necessarily art objects in the direct sense. They symbolize the concept of civilization as it is being defined by historians today. That is, it is a process that interweaves cultures, which means that it is not a static, unique event. The 19th century was obsessed with locating the oldest and the finest civilization. There was much written and talked about on the Greek miracle. We now consider such questions as irrelevant or not so relevant. The concept of distinctively separate civilizations, each with its demarcated territory, its single major language, and single dominant religion, has now been largely discarded by historians. Today, we study civilization as a porous, ongoing process, the making of which was dependent on considerable cross-fertilization. Territorial control, the use of language, and the practice of religion constantly change. What is important is to track the change and to ascertain how much of it has evolved from local factors and what emerges out of interaction with other cultures. We must remember that no culture is ever an island unto itself. And this interlocking needs to be reflected in museums. An, ex an impressive example of precisely this is demonstrated in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. The museum has a collection of Indian, Chinese, Central and West Asian, and Eastern Mediterranean objects. The whole span across Asia. So, instead of confining them to separate galleries, it linked the areas by using a theme, that of the Silk Route, the famous trade route that ran from China all the way to the Mediterranean. This was the pan Asian trade route that went from China through Central Asia, drawing in India and reaching the Eastern Mediterranean. Its time span was approximately the entire first millennium AD. The museum display demonstrates the interface between the areas and their cultures, highlighting the impact that they each had on each other. It gives form to precisely how the current concept of civilization should be defined. And I do think that this could be done in our museums to great effect for the Indian subcontinent with groups, contacts, and overlapping cultural regions. Museum displays remove objects from their original context and create a new context. Whether it is a sculpture taken out of a temple or a stupa, or calligraphy taken from a mosque or a tombstone, or a miniature painting that was once a book illustration, none of these objects 
has a context when it is displayed. The context obviously does not have to be physically present, but somehow should be indicated. When taken in isolation, out of context, the object, object becomes a commodity, with the predict predictable consequence of becoming a commercialized commodity. And commodification puts a price on each object, and it becomes an investment, as is common now among the wealthy. Antiques as investments may well result in the emergence of private museums, distinct from state museums. <coughs> museums dependent on state funding will slowly fall back in bidding for special objects in the art market, as is already beginning to happen. Frequently, it is the international market rather than the domestic market that determines the price. This makes it even more expensive for all kinds of economies. Yet, some significant objects should be located in accessible public museums in our countries. Perhaps we should consider some of the ways in which other countries like ours cope with this problem. Moving from the natural world to that made by humans had an underlying message. It demonstrated what was thought of as progress, from the natural to the primitive to the civilized. Exhibiting the past in a particular way was a method of showing that it had come to be understood by those who studied it. That was the assumption. This was a conviction that grew, amongst other things, from the idea, perhaps best expressed by the German historian of the time, great German historian who was always quoted, Leopold von Ranke, that history could reveal the past as it had actually been. Historicity was to be based on precisely what the sources tell us. Such empiricism has been dismissed as the narcotic of the 19th century. Yet, archaeology and the museum can discover and exhibit <coughs> some of these realities of the past. Merely laying out the object bypasses the responsibility that historians and curators have of selecting and analyzing the information that the objects present. The selection is inevitably linked, consciously or subconsciously, to the theory explaining the significance of that which is being exhibited. Setting up museums in the 19th century was additionally intended to state that the colonizing power was trying to comprehend the alien cultures over which it ruled. The attention tended to be paternalistic and not participatory. Until 1910, the Board of Trustees of the Indian Museum, for example, it's a long way from 1814 to 1910, was overwhelmingly British, with a small, tiny scatter of Indians. The British representation was either that of professionals specializing in the study of the sections represented in the museum, or they were employees of the government. The latter were not particularly innovative and seldom took the initiative to change the format. This is a problem that we continue to face in our state institutions linked to education. If I may say so, administrators assume that they too are specialists in disciplines. With the pace at which knowledge is advancing today, even specialists in dis disciplines find it hard to keep up, even on administrators. <laughs> Changes, therefore, tend not to be made when most required. The objects displayed in many museums begin with archaeological artifacts and move on to those generally recognized as symbols of high status, being associated with deities and royalty. In earlier days, there was a section, as I said, curiously called industrial arts. It had nothing to do with industries. 
although it consisted of objects that were handmade. The term referred literally to human industry and its outcome rather than to machines. In our times, this distinction is perhaps hinted at when a clear demarcation is sought between art and craft. We need to consider whether this distinction is invariably viable. Was the individual artist all that different from the individual craftsman in past times? Both were anonymous, but for the rare sculptor who was named, or painters associated with the Mughal court. What we call classical art from guilds became from guilds of craftsmen. As, it, as is attested to in texts and in inscriptions. By way of contrast, one thinks of the names of individual artists that are associated more usually with Greek classical sculpture. When does the individual artist begin to be recognized? And what does this mean for the way in which we today call art and how it's understood? The separation of art from craft also encouraged the distinction between popular culture and high culture, between the work of the craftsman intended for common people and that made for royalty and the elite. As for instance, the distinction between the Maurian Yakshi sculptures in stone and the Maurian terracotta figurines, even those from Chandakedugar. The craftsman who sculpted the stone figure was in fact just another craftsman, similar to the one who made clay figures. The distinction lay in professional training, often determined by the guild or the caste of the artist, and the material used, and of course, in ascertaining who was the patron for these different figures. In the case of the Yakshi, what she represented and the stonework involved in sculpting her points to patronage that was certainly a cut above the rest. This doubtless gave her a special status that set her aside from what may have been regarded as the more mundane other. This problem had earlier been raised, a couple had, had earlier raised a couple of questions but the questions are substantially unanswered. Does art get separated from craft? And if so, when and why? In their time, were these objects seen as functional or aesthetic or both? If the functional gets separated from the aesthetic in a museum, how is this to be explained to a viewer? Incidentally, it would be worth considering the degree to which the craft objects were perhaps made by women, as indeed some terracotta forms may well have been. A distinction between the courtly and the folk, or domestic as some prefer to call it, was of course made in medieval times. Courtly culture often referred, was often referred to as marga and was differentiated from the folk culture, or desi. Was this also an indirect distinction between the artist and the craftsman? The artists who painted birds and animals for, for Jamani did so under their own names. They followed the rules of their training, but could innovate if they chose to. The craftsmen of this period generally remained anonymous, although they too were technically trained and did on occasion innovate. And how did medieval times visualize earlier periods? How does someone at one point of time look at and represent narratives from earlier times? Miniature paintings often depict epic heroes of the ancient period in medieval dress and style. Mm -hmm. Are they being seen as people distant in time? Or is this an attempt to update personalities from the past? We today accept this updating and do not comment on it. How would we react to Ram and Ravan 
updated for the present, and shown dressed in shirt and trousers. <laughs> Perhaps it suggests that medieval artists and their patronage saw the past as more integral to their present, whereas we are more alienated from the past, seeing it as distinctly different. Yet style and patronage <clears throat> are complex matters. The Chandel kings of Bundelkhand were patrons of some of the finest sculpture in the medieval temples at Khadurao. Nevertheless, they were also patrons of the small shrine to their ancestral deity, Manya Devi in Mahoa. Manya Devi was an iconic. She was just a rock but was in worship and was later converted to the goddess Sharada, still an iconic. Mm -hmm. Was Manya Devi too private or too obscure to be sculpted into an icon? What was the reason for keeping the original form of the rock even after its patrons had been associated with temples dedicated to Puranic deities? Should an iconic deities not be accommodated in a museum, or at least portrayed, if only just to make the point that other forms were also significant to that cultural pattern. Viewing objects as items of heritage contributing to the identity of the society introduces yet another dimension to the usefulness of the museum. This is the point at which history enters its functioning. It is perhaps worth reminding ourselves that the hegemonic history of India in colonial times, actually even up to the late 20th century, was that of James Mill, the History of British India, published from 1818 to 1823. It was therefore contemporary with the establishing of the Indian Museum in 1814. Was there a link between the two in the thought processes of the two? Can it be argued that the understanding of the Indian past at that time, rooted as it was in colonial interpretations, was reflected not only in the histories of the time, but also in the display of major museums? Mill periodized the history of India into Hindu, Muslim, and British, a periodization that persists to this day despite it having no historical basis. Mm -hmm. Museum displays often segregate items by these periods. Within the periods, dynastic labels act as separators, even where the continuities are obvious. Chronology can be maintained without giving objects dynastic labels. Where a dynasty has ruled as briefly as the Shumba, can a sculpture be meaningfully and accurately, accurately ascribed to this dynastic period? Or would it not be better to give a somewhat broader time bracket? Sometimes the technical form is more helpful in recording and understanding the nature of change. Whereas mural painting is profuse in the first millennium AD, it is miniature painting that is the more common in the second millennium AD. What accounts for this change from painting on walls to painting on paper? It was a change of location, material, style, and inevitably content, encouraged no doubt by using paper for manuscripts. But there was surely much more that accounted for the introduction of miniature painting. Chronology itself is multifaceted. The past has its own pattern of time onto which we impose our chronology. For example, Fernand Brodel, one of the better known French historians of the last century, spoke of the three dimensions of time relevant to every historical event. These are the moment when the event happens, then the longer background of the context of the event, and finally what he calls the long duration, the many centuries that mold the landscape of the event. 
To this has now been added the fourth, namely, the point in time when the observer in the present perceives the object from the past, directly relevant to the museum. I am not suggesting that the chronology of each object should have these three time measurements, but only that the consciousness of these may be reflected in statements on chronology. With some rare exceptions, the display of objects in our museums tend to follow the periodization based on religion and dynasty, rather than considering other possible categories. Yet, historical periodization itself has now changed radically. A search for new classifications could be a very useful cross-disciplinary study between historians and curators. This is also tied into the labels given to objects. These tend to be minimalistic, giving information on dynasty and date, and if required, on religious identity. This is perfectly legitimate, provided sufficient information is also available in other forms. But the latter is generally lacking. It would be interesting to know, for instance, how the museum acquired a particular exhibit, especially if it's an important one. Where an icon or frieze is taken <coughs> from the external niche of the facade, a temple or a sofa, this needs to be stated, with some explanation of why it was placed on the facade initially, preferably with some graphic presentation of its original location. Where a painting was part of an illustrated manuscript, we need to be told what the text was about, and why was it commissioned, and by whom, and what incident is being depicted in the painting, in addition to the name of the artist and the date. Even where there are paintings of familiar stories, there is a need to draw attention to the special features that that particular painting may contain. All this, of course, means lengthier labels, more work for the curators. <laughs> but without this, the purpose of the museum is defeated. It also means that labels have to be constantly updated and corrected, a woeful lacuna in most Indian museums. Should the text of the introductory panels to the gallery provoke questions, or should it limit itself to providing information. For a questioning mind, this may make the exhibits more challenging. I am not suggesting that every gallery should be a textbook in itself, but for the visitor, it can provide accessible ways by which the object can be understood, both in isolation and as a collection. Fortunately, there are many electronic devices now that can be employed quite easily for this purpose. Not every visitor needs to read the lengthier text, but those that wish to know a little more should have not access to this knowledge. The answer is not more guided tours, but certainly more accessible background information. Curators, art historians, and other scholars may well be familiar with the history and value of the objects in display. For them, the museum as a place that houses, preserves, and exhibits uh, a collection of antiquities and historical artifacts may be sufficient. But the function of the museum today is the far larger role of educating citizens. These two aspects are interrelated. If the display does not give access to knowledge, it ceases to be of value in educating the public. This would influence a visitor's perception and experience of the exhibits. Thus, if a museum claims to project a visual representation of Indian civilization to the public, it has to be aware of the more recent discussions on what constitutes civilization. Walter Benjamin has argued that any object thus exhibited is embedded in a tradition. 
And if one is seeking for the aura of the object, it lies in the tradition. Others have argued that the museum liberates the object from its tradition and introduces other facets in its appreciation. But then, these other facets have to be pointed out. The museum is also a location of what is regarded as heritage. There are problems with defining heritage, since it is that which is seen as giving a nation its ancestry. It draws from a constellation of past events. Yet what we regard as our heritage today may not be the same as what our immediate ancestors believed was their heritage. For example, the Mauryan Emperor Ashok and his concept of Dhamma, often quoted as the source of our claim to non-violence and secularism, was virtually an unknown person for many centuries. He is just one indistinguishable name among dozens of others in the Puranic king lists. Only the Buddhists remembered him and wrote of him at length, but they were silenced by medieval times. Yet he was subconsciously remembered, perhaps through his pillars becoming part of first the history and then later the history of the Tughlaqs and the Mughals. Interestingly, interestingly, these later dynasties gave his pillars far greater attention than did the contemporary Hindu dynasties, because he was a Buddhist. He was rediscovered and established only in the 19th century when the decipherment of his edicts was made. But today he is viewed as part of our national heritage and claimed as a heritage unbroken and continuous for over two millennia. We have a diverse and multi-layered heritage. As is common to the construction of all national heritage all over the world, we face the problem of having to select from the past. We select that which we think would be conducive to constructing our heritage today. The cultures of the dominant communities invariably get pride of place, even if the attempt is to present a homogenized packet as a national culture. This does not necessarily reflect the sensitivities of our multiple cultures. We have perhaps now to think, to rethink our definition of heritage and make it more inclusive. There is a third equally important function of a museum, and with this I will come to a close, especially now that museums dedicated to particular objects are being established. This third function, I would say, is that of perceiving the exhibits and experiencing them as aesthetic objects. This, of course, has much to do with the aesthetic that one is surrounded by and the way in which the object is displayed. But the emphasis on either the historical or the aesthetic can be problematic. An icon need not be appreciated for its aesthetic quality in its own time, but we try and perceive it from what we think was that perspective. This is often affected by our own aesthetic, as uh, in the case of the portrait of the Buddha. We have to remember that what we regard as aesthetically sound may also change over time with new perceptions and with historical change. In this, the appeal to the museum is to have what some have called an elastic mind. Mm -hmm. A museum carries a message. In colonial days, it was the message of presenting a past and in doing so, taking credit for what colonial scholarship has done for the colony. This effort deserves appreciation, although its motivation may be questionable. But two centuries later, the contours have changed, both in terms 
what the museum stands for and what are its functions. The appeal is no longer to colonial authority, but to a public may be made aware of its heritage and its identity. The ingredients of this identity are complex since they are no longer just the narrow definitions of 19th century scholarship. The identity has to reflect a society constituted of many cultures, each seeking visibility. It is not only recognition of our culture, but also the many other cultures with which we have been and those with which we are interacting. Such a reflection is not an impossible task, but it needs both sensitivity and an understanding of the interface between cultures. The future of the museum requires us to think again about the museum as an institution. It is not enough that objects are displayed. We have to think about how this is done and why it is done the way it is. Are there other more effective and pertinent ways? The purpose of the museum has changed and this was bound to happen with conceptual changes in how we view the past and how we use the past. As with the writing of history, the museum also represents a mediation between the past and us. And the past is not something out there. The past is a part of us. We need to understand the past not in isolation, but in context. I can only repeat at the end the sentiment often repeated that a museum should make the invisible visible, but should also make the visible more visible.